Well then, why don't we go ahead and get started? It's 12.16 by my, by my watch. Thank you all for being here. I am Amanda Graham. I am the uh, Ac Academic Director for the Irving Institute for Energy and Society, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to our first Dartmouth Energy Collaborative Seminar of the spring term. Um, the Dartmouth Energy Collaborative is a uh, coalition of the four organizations that really do a lot in the energy space at Dartmouth. So it includes the Irving Institute for Energy and Society, as well as the Thayer School for Engineering, the Rever Center for Energy, Sustainability and Innovation at Tuck, and the Sustainability Office here at Dartmouth. And so we host these every other week talks um, throughout um, the academic year. And today we're really pleased to focus on critical materials powering the new energy economy, which is a vital enabling factor in uh, energy and renewable energy and energy storage. And so we're, we're delighted to have to host today's, today's talk. Um, as I mentioned, this is our first uh, fully hybrid event um, that we've had, so bear with us. Um, we are both in person with a, with a great, um, a, a small but mighty audience, and we are on Online with a with a great group, so um, so thank you for um, for um, for that. Um, so we'll be fielding questions both from in person as well as from online. When you have questions, please poke them into the the Q and A if you are online, and if you're in person, then raise your hand so that I see that you have a question you want to ask. Um, and so I'm going to do very brief introductions, and then I'm going to hand things over to our moderator for the day today, um, who will then get us get us started. Um, so our our talk is going to be given today by Edith Wilson, who is class of 1982 at Dartmouth. Um, she uh, got her undergraduate degree at Dartmouth in geology. And um, most recently, um, she is the CEO of Rock Whisperer, which is a fabulous name for a company. Um, and she is a consultant there um, on renewable energy and carbon, carbon climate risk mitigation. Um, she's based in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and um, there is a wonderful profile of Edith on the Irving Institute website. So that's linkable from the description for this talk. So feel free to find more about Edith there. And to moderate Edith's talk, we have Meredith Kelly, Professor Meredith Kelly from Earth Sciences. Um, she's also the graduate program coordinator for the um, Earth Sciences Department for EARS. Um, and um, her research focuses on the terrestrial record of past climate change. She is also co-teaching a new energy course this spring, which is titled Transforming the Energy System. And we're delighted that she is in the mix um, with our energy uh, curriculum here at Dartmouth. So, um, so thank you both for being here. And without further delay, let me hand things over to Meredith to get the ball rolling. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, so it's really my pleasure to welcome everyone and um, also to be here and to be part of this um, uh, seminar and question and answer session with Edith Wilson. Um, I guess I'll start out by talking a bit about the topic for this um, seminar. Um, so I'm an earth scientist. I actually don't really study um, energy resources, but I'm very interested in them, mainly because I study climate and I'm interested in understanding climate change and future climate projections. And as we know, we are transitioning to this, to this new energy system where we hope we're going to be based much more on renewable energy than our typical fossil fuel energy system that relies on hydrocarbon resources. Um, and in this transition, um, the, the new energy system really requires and relies um, on, on materials, specifically minerals and other materials that are profoundly different from what the, our, our typical um, fossil fuel energy system relies on. And so, so we wanna explore this idea and what this transition is gonna require in this um, series on critical minerals. And I'm, I'm really excited um, to have Edith here today. Um, so she is going to, uh, let me get a brief introduction. Um, so Edith, uh, I had the pleasure of meeting a, a few months ago when she visited the Earth Sciences Department um, as an alumni, as sort of our one of our um, career-oriented seminars, which was fantastic. And she has just had an incredible career in energy resources. Um, she, uh, after finishing at Dartmouth, she got a um, master's and PhD at John Hopkins, studying. Um, carbonate sedimentology, which may mean something to some of you and nothing to many of you, but it basically means understanding those rocks that, that oil and gas exist in um, and understanding sort of how and where to find oil and gas and then how to extract them. And she went on and applied that incredible knowledge working in oil and gas companies as, as an explorer um, and as 
uh, a negotiator, as a manager. So she has had many different roles in, in a couple of different oil and gas companies. And then since then, she's had this incredible transition of, of a career into sort of coming at this from the other side and, and, and working um, with her knowledge of, of energy and also now mineral resources um, to uh, communicate with professionals about energy solutions and, and advise and consult. And it's just this fantastic, I, I think, career development that, that I am interested to learn more about and I'm interested to learn from you. So Edith, welcome and, and I'll hand it over to you. Oh, thank you um, everyone for, first of all, for the invitation to speak with you all. And uh, secondly, for all of the warm welcoming words. It's um, it, having just been on the Dartmouth campus in February, I feel as though I've been transported back um, to your beautiful building there at the Irving Institute. So I'm going to share my screen and I'll hope for a thumbs up from, uh, from those of you uh, there. Excellent. Okay, great. Well, let's begin the discussion. Um, you'll, you'll have to forgive me. I'm a geologist. I'm a visual learner. So we have lots of pictures and maps. And I hope that you won't take that as too much of a lecture format. I'll try to work through these few slides and concepts and leave plenty of room for back and forth discussion and um, looking at some additional data um, if we want to. But what I'm here to, um, uh, to open a conversation on today is really the topic of the critical minerals that are going to be required to build the new energy economy. And the energy arena is undergoing revolutionary change. I, I hear the term energy transition all the time, and that just is not enough for me. This really is a transformative event that we are experiencing um, in the energy economy, which underpins our economy at large. And with this change in the energy arena comes a, a, an enormous demand for materials and particularly for critical minerals. We're going to need not only materials to build the new energy economy, the renewable infrastructure, the windmills, the solar panels, um, but also the electronics to monitor and control the delivery of industry. And most especially and specifically, we're going to need um, a large quantity of new critical minerals to build the new energy storage devices that, that we require. So we could fill our talk today with a bunch of maps of where all of these materials lie and what all of the um, uh, fundamental underpinnings of the energy transition are, but I want to really focus on what I'm convinced is the most critical driver of the energy transition. Um, and we all know the clear advantages of lessening CO2 emissions and improved resilience, um, but um, uh, and, and certainly the, the importance of accelerating the energy transition so that we can um, uh, prevent our planet from, from becoming uninhabitable as, we, as those of us who've um, had a chance to read some of the summary documents from the latest um, um, uh, IPCC report um, understand all too well. But I would argue that um, the energy transition didn't really pick up pace and become a revolution until economics came into play. And I, I show you this slide, which is sort of an amalgamation of data, so should not be taken for its indivi individual data points per se, but more for the trends that it illustrates. But these data are accumulated from Lazard, from Bloomberg New Energy finance, a few from Wood McKenzie. And what they show is this foundational shift in the cost of energy over the course of only 10 years. So for example, um, the um, green line shows the change in cost for a kilowatt hour um, in dollars of wind um, generated electricity since 2009 up through 2020. And what you can see is a significant drop from about $140 per megawatt hour to $40 per megawatt hour. But more importantly, look at that orange line of the change in cost of solar from um, $360 per megawatt hour in 2009 to less than $40. 
um, in 2020. That's a, an order of magnitude 10 times less per unit of energy delivered in electricity from solar over the course of 10 years. And in the red dotted line, we see a similar um, cost drop in the, um, in the cost of storage. So there's this sort of magic moment that occurs in around 2018, 2019, 2020, when this triumvirate of wind, solar, and storage becomes the lowest form, the lowest cost uh, to deliver um, new electrical energy um, to the world. So you see the little drop of oil there, which actually represents the lowest cost fossil fuel alternative of combined cycle natural gas generation power plants. Um, but and, and while these numbers will change, you know, in the coming uh, years, depending on, um, you know, political risk, um, uh, cost supply chain issues, things like that, this relative drop of, of, of the big three in renewable energy below the cost of the lowest cost fossil fuels is transformational and, and fundamental. I mean, imagine if suddenly it cost... Um, uh, a tenth of the amount to educate a student at Dartmouth. Um, instead of spending $10 million to drill a well, you only had to spend a million dollars to, to drill the same well, or a product cost um, dropped an order of magnitude over the course of 10 years. This is a fundamental economic lever, and, and this is what is really causing the acceleration of the energy transition. So today, what, what I want to focus on, um, obviously, we need more materials to build windmills, to build solar panels. Most of those materials are fairly common, um, silica, steel, cement, etc. Um, but what I want to focus on today is the trigger for um, this uptake of renewable energy worldwide, which is really the advent of affordable and accessible energy storage. Um, for renewable energy. Um, in the background of this slide, you can see our old friend, the periodic table, you know, we're all kind of <laughs> becoming a lot more familiar with some of those uh, weird and funky names than we used to be outside of freshman chemistry class. But um, uh, what I want to focus on again are those materials that are going to be required in large quantities and very rapidly to build these energy storage devices, right? So when we look at those and the data on the left are from um, a, a 2020 article in Science based on some World Bank data and th these change um, over time as well. But just again, conceptually, what we can see is if we just look at minerals needed for low carbon energy storage technology alone, the big three, as I call them, lithium, cobalt, and graphite, are going to rise in demand over the next you know, couple of decades, if not um, a shorter time uh, frame in, in, in multipliers, right? We're going to need a thousand percent more lithium by 2020 to build the batteries that we need to make. Now, one of the first questions that this sort of um, realization brings up is, is there enough capital in the energy economy to extract all of these minerals? And um, if you're not already addicted to the visual capitalist as I am, they do great um, visualizations of, of fundamental economic concepts. And so I've stolen their diagram here on the right. And here's this big bubble representing um, the oil and gas investment economy of almost $2 trillion. Um, and within that, you see all of the, the, the quantifiable investment in, um, in all the metals that we're talking about. And there in the upper right, you see this tiny $3 billion bubble for lithium. So even if we multiply that by nine times, 10 times, we're still just a drop in the bucket of all the capital that's going in to extract fossil fuel resources. And there's a good reason for that. Fossil fuel resources, once they're used to deliver a unit of energy, are gone forever. The energy is stored in that hydrocarbon bond. And once we blow it up and combust it and use the energy that creates, 
we have to replace that hydrocarbon over and over. That's why it's so capital intensive to support an energy economy with fossil fuels. So the capital is out there. There are other issues related to how that capital is deployed and the return on investment moving from the oil and gas sector to the mining sector, but I'm not going to go into those details now. Um, but I just want you to see that even though there is a phenomenal increase in the materials required for energy storage, the capital is available in the energy market out there to, to take care of those needs. But what I want to focus the rest of this talk on is sort of a, a more fundamental understanding of how the supply chain for these materials works, because it's very different from the oil and gas world where most of the effort and value add in the product is in simply extracting it from the ground. When we look at the supply chain for the, the minerals and materials that are required to build energy storage devices, it encompasses not just looking for those minerals and discovering new deposits of them, not only mining them, but also processing them with advanced technology to get just the right flake of graphite, just the perfect spherical um, of or perfect shape of cobalt or just the right chemistry of lithium at a certain um, uh, spec for whatever battery supply line it's going into. And then there is the manufacturing and new battery tech development side of things. And the other piece that is uh, new to this energy supply chain, again, from the world of, of fossil fuel um, underpinning our energy economy, is that every bit of this material once the electroactivity is spent from it and it can no longer perform its function, every bit of this material is still remaining and can be reused, repurposed, or recycled. And, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the changes that are happening on that end of things as well. So as one of my favorite clients says, if it isn't grown, it, it's mined. It all comes from the ground, whether we're using fossil fuels to create energy or we're using critical minerals to build batteries, all of that material ultimately comes from the ground. What's different about the supply chain for critical materials for building energy storage devices is that we have to consider all of these components to the supply chain, including reuse and recycling. We can't just stop with extracting it and handing it over to a, to a global market. It's a vertically integrated game from start to finish. Now, the green line at the top of this graph is, again, just a proportional representation of lead time for each of these processes. So while um, manufacturing may occur over the course of a couple of years, um, perhaps recycling may take weeks, months, uh, or years, um, we all know that mining has a much longer lead time on the, on the order of several to tens of years. Um, exploration used to have a tremendous lead time. There's been, in recent years, the application of big data, of AI, um, by some very forward-thinking mineral exploration firms that are sort of helping to shortcut that a little bit. Um, but this big lump of time at, at the beginning of the process to, to be able to open a new mine is, is a real barrier. So there are some things that are happening to sort of shrink that lead time and mining. One is to where we have existing base metal mines, copper, etc., to see if we can um, extract secondary production of cobalt, for example, from copper mines so that we don't have to build a new mine, we just add a stream at existing mines. Um, uh, we can also ramp up production at existing mines where certain ore grades may not have been economically feasible to begin with, but perhaps now with new battery storage demands they are. And in addition, new extraction processes, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the talk. So there are all kinds of great problems to solve in this mining supply chain um, that will help us to, um, uh, to, to keep the lead times down and to, to keep things moving from one link in the chain to the other. So finally, here's a geologist with a map. 
<laughs> so um, those of you who are not earth scientists, um, you'll just have to uh, uh, put up with the way we view the world, but um, we always see uh, everything in terms of its spatial location and where it exists in the globe. So I'm going to start with this map and I'll tell you a little bit about what's represented on it. Um, uh, and we're gonna build a picture of a couple of these supply chains uh, for critical minerals um, uh, on top of this map. And, and I'm gonna focus, I'm gonna pick on lithium because lithium is the one that's on everyone's tongue all of the current major battery manufacturers for EVs, for um, utility scale um, uh, battery storage backup, most of them are focused on building a better lithium ion battery with some kind of chemistry associated with it. Um, so lithium is in the news. Lithium is what you're gonna see prices going up and down on. So, um, so here's a map of the world and you see two things on this map. You see some red dots and some blue dots. Um, all of those dots, both red and blue, are from the U.S. Geological Survey's catalog of where lithium occurs all over the world. So the red dots are what we call hard rock lithium. These are traditional mines like you would see in the western U.S., um, open pit or underground mines where we're going in and extracting a hard rock from the ground that has lithium in it and extracting um, from the spodumene, which is the name of the mineral, the lithium that we use in our batteries. Those are the red dots. The blue dots are a different kind of lithium occurrence. It's lithium that occurs in near surface or surface brines, like in the so-called lithium triangle there in South America, um, where there are numerous uh, brines containing lithium in the high Altiplano deserts and Salars in Chile and, uh, um, uh, and Bolivia. So, um, uh, and Argentina. So, um, so red dots and blue dots, both lithium occurrences, different. But what you see is there are known lithium occurrences all over the world, right? Um, they're not limited. Now, some of these are more prolific than others, but we have known lithium occurrences um, in most of the countries of the world. Um, what we also have shown on this map in red is the country of Australia, which today produces over half of all lithium mined globally in the world. And it, you can see by the color of the dots here, Australia produces this, this lithium from hard rock spodumene mines. The other place that the, uh, the next largest amount of lithium is produced in the world today is from the lithium triangle in South America, from these lithium brine deposits. Another 30% of global lithium comes from, from these occurrences. And then in yellow, you see China, which has both spodumene and brine deposits of lithium. And uh, in China, um, they produce about another 17% of the world's lithium. Um, but despite the fact that most of the lithium in the world is, is mined, produced, mined out of South America and Australia, almost 80% of it goes to China for processing for that critical next step. So at this point in our supply chain, we have a diverse supply. We have two big supplies of lithium. So we have a globally diverse uh, bilateral supply of lithium, but we have a very um, uh, singular place where that lithium is then processed. Now that is changing as as activity from the so-called OEMs or original equipment manufacturers, as those OEMs begin to realize that they need to secure a supply chain for their lithium, we're seeing uh, companies like Tesla, for example, who in 2020 on their battery day, announced that they were building, in addition to building that gigafactory to produce trucks in Austin, Texas, they announced fairly quietly, but to those of us who, who are interested in supply chains, this was pretty impressive. They announced that they would be building right next to that gigafactory the US's first lithium hydroxide refinery, that critical step in processing to try to bring that processing step closer to where the, the, the vehicle and the battery, the battery itself were being manufactured. 
And they also announced a partnership with Piedmont Lithium, who has a lithium deposit, one of these little red dots that we've known about forever in the Appalachians. And Tesla announced that they were going to partner with Piedmont Lithium uh, to exploit those lithium resources closer to their newly built lithium hydroxide refinery. So this is what we see that's really different about critical minerals versus the fossil fuel industry. You know, when you go and flip the switch on your um, electricity that comes from a coal fired power plant, it's sort of irrelevant where that coal was mined. Um, but when Tesla needs to build a lithium ion battery in Austin, they want their refinery with their specs right there. And they wanna be able to feed it with local supply of lithium. So interestingly, and again, um, a little geology here for those of you who are um, non-technical, I, 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 I will walk you through it, but this deposit in the Carolinas in the so-called tin spodumene belt just here um, uh, northwest of Gastonia, North Carolina, um, this project, this occurrence of spodumene has been known since a beautiful paper written by Hess in 1940 and um, has been mapped and documented and cored. Um, uh, we knew this was there. It, it, it wasn't the case that suddenly someone last year sprung up and said, I found a new lithium deposit. This has been there and known about for almost a century, but it's the OEM pulling this lithium out of the ground. It's that original equipment manufacturer coming and, and reactivating uh, this mine uh, to bring spodumene to their project. So that's one thing that's happened in the U.S. And, uh, and the other thing that I'd like to show you, um, an, a similar example, concerns some of our brine deposits um, in Southern California that are being accessed through investment by GM, another OEM. And they are partnered with a geothermal resource contractor called Controlled Thermal Resources that is already creating geothermal energy to feed the California grid, but is now um, uh, coupling that with an, a lithium extraction line from those brines, those same hot brines that they are drilling and bringing up to the surface to create the geothermal energy, they're extracting the lithium from it before they pump it back down. So the beauty of this is that you have an existing system that is already commercially producing renewable clean energy for the California grid, geothermal energy, and you're just adding on to it that lithium extraction. So all of that, the, the, the most carbon intensive part of the lithium processing step is that electricity um, to create the lithium chemicals that are needed. And that's all coming from renewable sustainable energy. So making this more efficient, sort of shortcutting the process. And the process that they're using is one that was developed um, through a, a Breakthrough Energy Ventures backed um, uh, new technology called Lilac. And these sorts of operations are just generating jobs like crazy for geothermal engineers, for geoscientists, for chemists, for, um, for water quality experts. So again, just two examples of where that, that fully vertically integrated supply chain is pulling this material out of deposits that have lain fallow for years. The other thing that's happening in the mining industry is that um, you know, using carbon um, and carbon footprint life cycle analysis of, of, of carbon uh, uh, processed through the, through the system, using that as a proxy for efficiency, mining companies are actively pursuing lower carbon initiatives, among them uh, going all electric in their underground mining vehicles, floating solar power on their tailings ponds, um, uh, making better use of uh, environmental um, control of the surface, uh, interacting more um, 
uh, more with more engagement um, with uh, uh, with the um, the human factor at the surface, creating a better license to operate. All of these things are the problems and the solutions that mining companies now are working through as they encounter the same old difficulties they've always had of of permitting, of extracting without destroying the environment um, uh, nearby, um, but also of trying to make their process of creating new materials for energy storage as low carbon as possible. I, I mentioned I would also just uh, give a nod to the last element of the supply chain, which is recycling and reusing these materials. And this is where I think we're seeing the most kind of exciting um, uh, innovative startup technology happening. I've picked on this one that I saw recently in a Scientific American article. Um, Ascend Elements is actually taking old cathode materials, which is one part of that lithium ion battery, taking old cathode materials and using a, a process to recycle them that actually produces cathode materials that have a higher energy density, a higher specific energy, a higher capability of, 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 of delivering energy per unit mass of material actually has a higher specific energy than the incoming materials. So they are not only recycling old cathodes into new cathodes, they're creating better, better cathodes while they do it. So, and these companies are all over the place. Some of them will, will make earth shattering um, discoveries. Some of them will, will go belly up, but um, this is where a lot of really exciting new engineering uh, technology is happening because we can recycle these components in this new energy storage system. And the last thing I wanna leave you with is that in addition to all of the differences in how we have to look at the supply chain with critical minerals versus um, uh, the, the, the energy supply chains we're used to working with. Um, there really is a very um, uh, dramatic difference in the business model per se, and it has significant ramifications, not just for business, but also for culture and for um, uh, social aspects and, and for the potential to deliver energy equity to the world. And what I mean by that is that our old system of energy delivery, while we improved on it through the decades from the early 20s you know, to, um, to the 2020s, we made um, great enhancements and improvements to how we extracted energy more efficiently and more affordably. Still, because of the nature of that fossil fuel business and the need to replace reserves and the need to combust energy, we were looking at a business that was very high risk, very high rate of return, large capital investments, long investment cycles, and very infrastructure dependent. The renewable energy world is quite different. Whether you consider this in the um, upper right, there's a picture of the, um, uh, I can't remember the, the California um, uh, project at, um, uh, uh, oh, yep, I've forgotten to write down the name of it. Um, a California project that is a hotel complex that has its own uh, microgrid system um, and independent solar generation. Whether you're looking at that scale of a project or you're looking at the little Homaya system offered by Schneider in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, which is a little home, single panel, uh, TV running, battery charging, motor scooter charging system um, uh, for a single family. Regardless of what scale of distributable energy resources we're looking at, we're looking at a very low risk, low rate of return, low capital investment, rapidly deployed an infrastructure independent world in the new energy world. So you can see that these different business models can have fairly strong ramifications. And I, I'm delighted to, to say that I now think that the question posed by this um, figure from Oxfam in 2015 of that shows that the, the, the wealthiest 10% of our nation's um, citizens provided 50% 
of the carbon. And when we look at this kind of, of top heavy mushroom, um, it begs the question of how can we use the same energy model to provide energy equity to those who have little to none without boiling the planet and making it inhabitable. And, and, and so thank goodness with the advent of cost dropping and new energy technology, no, we don't have to sacrifice climate for energy equity. And in fact, I, I, I give you this as a sort of a visual, and this is from um, uh, the Johnny Miller's photographic um, uh, tableau called Unequal Scenes. If you haven't ever seen this, it's fairly um, thought provoking. And this is from an urban space in Gauteng, South Africa, and it juxtaposes um, across a road um, a neighborhood that is, you know, one of those uh, fully supported by the fossil fuel infrastructure, flip a switch and electricity comes on to a world where um, there is no um, energy resource outside of a little bit of coal and, uh, um, and, and all of the concomitant um, uh, uh, poverty and, and, um, and, and risk that that lack of energy equity brings. So the question is, you know, how we couldn't create um, the left-hand world for everyone uh, in this right-hand world, but with the advent of affordable and efficient energy technology, we can, as shown in this photo at, in Kayamundi outside of Cape Town, another um, densely populated community in sub-Saharan Africa, each one of these small dots on the rooftop is a solar panel. So this new opportunity with the new energy economy to create a world where, um, uh, where we can energize um, the unelectrified and underelectrified parts of our community and spread energy equity um, uh, a little more broadly, that capability is there without the, the concomitant cost to the planet. I was really delighted to see Bloomberg New Energy Finance this morning had an article about another million electric scooters in India. Um, you know, what's going to change this world is not a new electric Hummer. In, in the US, what's gonna change the world is hundreds of millions of new electric scooters and hundreds of millions of homes who have electricity from battery backed solar. Um, and, uh, and, and we will be uh, perhaps clinging to our grid, wondering, you know, uh, wondering how to acquire all this great new technology um, that the renewable energy world brings. So I leave you with my sunset slide, which is that I, as an energy geoscientist who has worked in so many different parts of the system, am more and more um, convinced than ever before that we have a chance to meet um, uh, United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number seven and do our best to ensure access to affordable, reliable, and sustainable energy for everyone on the planet. And it, now it's just a question of no system is without its problems. Um, now it's just a question of solving the problems of the future, which I think are fascinating and interesting. And I think all of you all associated with the Irving Institute and all the many groups at Dartmouth, uh, you have a wonderful future in front of you looking at some of these problems. I think it's, it's just a great um, landscape uh, for, for you to build careers on. So very excited to be a part of it at the end of my career. And thank you so much for your attention. That's, that's the end of my prepared remarks. Thank you so much, Edith. That was really, um, was really incredible and insightful, and I learned a ton. Um, so I have, uh, I have questions, and our question and answer. I'm going to invite anyone to pop questions in there, and I'll go through these. Um, Edith, I'll start out. Um, with one uh, that asks, uh, most of the minerals listed are not primarily produced or considered as primary minerals in known deposits. Copper and nickel, copper and nickel are some of the most intensely required minerals for the renewable systems. How much new metal is required in order to build the infrastructure required for the renewable market? And what does this look like in terms of mines existing versus new? So. 
clear. Okay. Um, yeah, I um, I will. I think I think I understand what the question is getting at, and and in part, um, yes, there are certainly um, uh, base metals, copper, nickel, tin, etc., that are required for building the components of renewable energy. Um, you have to keep in mind that those are also required to build um, pipelines and oil field rigs and all of the physical infrastructure associated with our old energy infrastructure. So in some respects, there will be a shift. Now, even with, and, and you may have seen um, that those metals um, on my big bubble diagram stolen from Visual Capitalist, um, you, you can see even those metals the, from, from, a, from, a, from an investment value perspective, um, there is a lot of um, capital bandwidth for improving those metals, right? Um, the comment about primary deposits, I'm not quite sure I either understand or agree with that. Perhaps the, the, the questioner might um, get in contact with me later on, because certainly for the, um, for the, the metals that are now experiencing the most radical increase in demand are those which were not necessarily already being used for infrastructure projects. For example, lithium wasn't used to make steel. Nickel was, nickel is. So the increase in nickel required for batteries is less than something like cobalt or lithium because prior to this, those metals were not really part of our infrastructure recipe, if you will. So, so the incremental amount of nickel required for batteries is less than the incremental amount of lithium required for batteries, if that makes sense and answers that piece of the question. Um, but, but certainly um, uh, those, and, and I can uh, put this back up in just a sec, um, those metals, the question about um, uh, about uh, how much of those base metals is going to be required for, um, for simply building storage and renewable infrastructure was addressed in some respects in this slide. You can see copper, aluminum, manganese all the way at the bottom here. It's not that we're not going to need more for low carbon energy technology. It's just that we're already using so much copper for everything we're already building that the uptick is not of the same scalable order of magnitude um, that we're seeing uh, for those that are brand new demand for energy storage. So I hope that's kind of a muddy answer, but I hope that helps the questioner. Great, thank you so much. Um, let me ask one more from the Q&A and I know there's a question from the in-person audience as well. Um, so let me go first and then I'll pass it on to Amanda there. Um, so the question is, what would the carbon emissions trade-off look like to reduce capital in the oil and gas sector and invest more in critical material mining, like lithium for energy storage? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a, a, a fantastic, question that that changes on a daily basis. Um, if you look at, and I sort of do back of the envelope calculations all the time, um, as we are changing our battery chemistries and our making improvements in energy density and all of that, but but the to the best of my ability to, to do these calculations, we are looking at, um, about an order of magnitude difference in carbon emissions per, let's take a, an easy example, per kilometer driven by an internal combustion engine versus an EV. For example, if I, if I include all the carbon necessary to build a, a, an ICE vehicle to, um, to, to fill the tank and run it, um, uh, I, 
and and to um, and to extract that oil and gas as well. So both the production and the use case. Um, I'm looking at something like um, 300 uh, grams equivalent um, of carbon per kilometer that I drive um, in the hundreds, right? If I do the same thing for an electric vehicle and I include all the carbon necessary to mine the lithium, all the carbon necessary to make the battery, all the carbon necessary to make the car, I'm looking at and all the carbon necessary to generate the electricity to charge the battery, I'm looking at something like 30. So tens of, of, of grams of carbon per kilometer driven, right? So, so there's certainly um, a, a, an enormous um, carbon savings in going from a system where I've got to blow up and replenish my fuel, my energy storage device every, for every unit of, of work that I do um, to one where the electroactive materials give over and over and over again for a, a similar amount of carbon usage to produce it. So yeah, there's a, there's a, a pretty fantastic balance there um, and it is changing and improving as new technology develops. Great, thank you. Um, can I take one from the uh, in-person audience, please? I have a question from the in-person audience. Hi, thank you for your, uh, your talk, uh, fascinating. Uh, I've got a question about uh, what does the future look like for ocean seabed mining of the nodules? <laughs> wow, that is a, you've, you've picked a, 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 a highly um, topical and sometimes controversial uh, 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 discussion. Um, I can tell you that since I rejoined the mining community about five or six years ago, I have seen several companies, you know, startups looking at how to, just from a commercial standpoint, from a technological and commercial standpoint, how to um, commoditize those very high um, metal nodules in the deep ocean floor. Um, uh, unfortunately, that's only one of the factors that's that's critical to understanding it uh, or to being able to to use that material. And 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 what we're talking about are highly highly concentrated um, uh, deposits of some of these metals that are just sitting as nodules in the deepest parts of the ocean basins. We've known about these for years. Um, but there are a couple of things that are that are big barriers to cross first. One is ownership. You know, who owns the deep ocean floor? We don't have an ownership model for anything beyond sort of the continental shelf, right? So um, uh, that's, a, that's a big issue um, that I don't pretend to even understand how it would, would one day be resolved. And the other is um, more fundamentally scientific, which is um, A, how do, you, how do you technologically and commercially mine them, how do you go out, how do you physically go out to the deep ocean and mine them? And I think there has been some technology uh, advancement along those lines, but perhaps more important, at least to an earth scientist like me, what does, um, you know, messing with the big ocean buffer chemistry is, you know, something that, <laughs> that I, I wonder about a lot. And, uh, I, and again, I, this is not my area of expertise, but um, if we disrupt that chemical ecosystem on the ocean floor, you know, what are the potential, um, uh, in the same way we need to consider our environmental impact for surface mining and our impact on, uh, on the people around those mines, you know, how are we going to impact the ocean floor with both the extraction process and the change in the chemical environment? So those are all big questions. You do see companies that are, um, you know, uh, looking into uh, these, you know, clearly available um, metal resources, but big issues still to be determined as to whether or not they will compete with, um, uh, with uh, similar resources at the surface of the earth on the continents. Great, super interesting question and um, thinking through these different locations where minerals occur. Um, okay, uh, could we have time for a few more questions? If that's Sounds good. Um, so one is, is the low rate of financial return on renewable energy projects a significant barrier 
to their widespread adoption? Is it difficult for renewable developers to secure the financing that they need with that prospect of low return for investors? A great question, and and probably um, you know you might even say um, uh, because of the way I worded it, um, uh, maybe even uh, a little bit of a of a um, uh, of a planted question. I think the low return on investment is more of a of a benefit than it is a barrier, and and what I mean by that is um, uh, the the system of this high return on investment because you were adding value, accumulating assets of oil and gas that were precious because they were finite, um, tended to sort of drive that wealth into um, a concentrated form um, uh, being, being sort of gathered and held by a few companies or a few individuals um, in, in some instances. Whereas uh, more the, the, the utility model, the, the service model, if you will, you know, trying to provide the least expensive, most efficient, um, highest technology energy possible at the lowest cost, you know, that's what our utilities have been doing for years. And now they just have a, another tool in their toolbox to do that more efficiently um, with, with all kinds of great problems to solve about supply demand and energy balance and all of that, which is not my, my cup of tea, but which is a fascinating arena. Um, but, but I think what that low return on investment does is actually um, improve access to all of these opportunities. Um, very interesting story in my hometown. I sit here in Tulsa, Oklahoma at the heart of um, the old oil and gas world. And uh, we just had a, you know, a, a sort of a, um, an interesting discussion, I'll say, about renewing our utility agreement because our environmentalists in town very much wanted our city to impose on the utility the obligation to use renewable resources in their energy mix. Um, and of course, our city government being founded in the principles of, of you know, great natural gas generating fire, uh, natural gas generating power plants and coal generating power plants didn't want to impose that requirement on the utility. So there was a big kerfuffle and at the end of the day, nothing really happened from the city perspective. When the utility renewed our um, uh, purchase agreement, it's 91% renewable because that's the cheapest form of electricity. And what they want is cheap, affordable electricity that they can provide more service to customers with. So I think whether you're talking about um, uh, the choice of a, of a small homeowner in, in Brazil being able to go to the hardware store and buy a solar panel and maybe get microfinancing from it from the provider like Siemens or Schneider, or you're talking about a utility in Tulsa, Oklahoma, making the choice for wind and solar because it's, it's less expensive and more efficient and meets their service model. I think that low return on investment is a benefit to, it's, it's just a reflection of the fact that the business model is really different. And it does mean that those, those big oil investors are going to have to search for another way to, uh, to, to, to understand their business growth. Um, um, super interesting. Thank you, Edith. Um, uh, a couple more. Um, so, uh, some people think batteries will inevitably cause pollution, either during mining or improper recycling. So they're more optimistic about hydrogen power vehicles as opposed to EVs. What do you think about that? Yeah, and that's a great <laughs> that's a great question. The you know the the thing that often gets left out of those arguments about pollution and about mining impact and all is is this lever of you know we're working with mining an electroactive material once and using it over and over and over again for the same amount of environmental impact where we would have had to replace reserves over and over again on the on the oil and gas side. So you have to kind of, you can't just say, I need this much lithium for every unit of energy I generate. You have to put that that divider in there, right? And, and a lot of the 
a lot of the work I see, you know, sort of doesn't take that into account. And as we've talked about on the recycling side, um, you know, <laughs> there is a big realization, first of all, that that most of the scrap on the manufacturing floor for batteries is incredibly useful and valuable. And so there's a huge effort to, to do that. But even, you know, this concept that these lithium ion batteries are just going to accumulate in landfills somewhere, I can tell you right now, there is way more value in them than, than will ever allow that to happen. Now, we haven't cracked the nut on, on perfect commercial recycling yet, but those are the fun problems to solve, right? So I, I, I sense that that is, while it is built up to be a concern on some people's part, I think it is a little bit overinflated. Um, and I think there are just a lot of, I think it just presents a great problem to solve, <laughs> you know, a, a wonderful problem to solve. On the hydrogen side, the fascinating thing about hydrogen, I think the EV industry at least has made its choice. They have said the most economically feasible um, for us is, is a, a battery powered EV. Um, we're just seeing that, that sort of happen in the, in the economic landscape. But hydrogen is becoming um, a storage device, right? If we can uh, generate uh, solar energy and, and, and make green hydrogen out of it instead of blue or gray hydrogen, meaning making hydrogen by breaking the hydrogen atom off of a water molecule and thereby only releasing oxygen and making that using all the energy to make that as renewable clean energy, then all of a sudden we have a hydrogen product that is storable and transportable and can be used in rockets or airplanes or cars or whatever, or to burn and generate electricity um, but but it's it's fungible, right? It's storable uh, where solar energy is not. So so hydrogen at green hydrogen as a storage mechanism is a wonderful low carbon uh, uh, opportunity, and and we're seeing a lot of our um, a lot of our companies and and countries around the world uh, looking at that as an option. Great, thank you. Um... So can I give you one more quick one? And then I have one for you. Is that okay? And I'll want to wrap up. So I'm going to ask this one to be super quick. Um, what is the potential for extracting critical minerals from existing mine waste um, extraction and tailings? Uh, great question. And I will give you a quick answer. Phenomenal. And there are people working on that um, at universities and in research labs and think tanks. Um, uh, if you contact me on LinkedIn, I'll put you in touch with some folks, but absolutely not only extracting um, usable, valuable materials from mine waste, but also using the interaction of mine waste with the atmosphere to sequester carbon. Phenomenal opportunity. Cool. All right. Well, Edith, I want to thank you so much. It's been really incredibly um, informative, educational, and really interesting. And I just, I love your optimism about the future. I think that's amazing. Um, so I want to give you the last minute or two um, just to wrap up and give us any final thoughts you have or any like good take home messages we can go home and be hopeful with. <laughs> I don't know. I just, as you said, I may be um, uh, a, a, a rosy colored glasses person, but I see this as a, a yes, there are problems. Um, and I, I always hear, especially from uh, some colleagues who are um, embedded in, in different parts of, of the energy spectrum, I, I, I hear a lot of, um, well, what about ism? Um, and all that says to me is, wow, let's, let's solve the problem of the future. Let's work on making energy resources more sustainable, more efficient, more economic, and more available to everyone. Let's do whatever we can to make that happen that still leaves the planet habitable. And there's so many fun opportunities to pursue that way. Let's solve the problems of tomorrow. Great. Let me thank, um, thank Edith again. And... Um... We'll wrap up. Thanks everybody for attending. We really appreciate your your um, excitement about this topic, and we hope that you join us in the in the upcoming critical materials series. Thank you. Would love to.
Thank you so much, Edith. Thank you so much, Meredith. And, um, and, and thank you, Meredith, for pointing that there are things coming up in the future. So actually, if we could put up our slide about a couple of our next events um, uh, that are um, happening in the energy space. Uh, next week, Wednesday the 13th, um, our new energy series, which is an online series, continues with uh, another young uh, energy and society scholar, Churchill Agutu from Eteha Zurich, speaking on off-grid technologies in Africa. Uh, and then two weeks from today, back in this space, our, um, our next energy collaborative talk is takes a little bit of a different angle, but we're reflecting on 50 years of energy policy, perspectives from Don Deutsch, Don, John Deutsch, who is a professor emeritus at MIT, former head of the CAA, really interesting vantage point for many, many years of being involved, uh, involved with energy, and that's collaboratively with the Thayer School of en Engineering and their Great Issues in Energy series. So um, thank you to all for joining us. Thank you so much to Edith for a really inspiring and enlightening talk. Thank you to Meredith for a great job in fielding our many, many questions. And thank you to all of you for being here with us today. Have a wonderful afternoon. Be well. <laughs>